The sponsors of this conference believe in nonviolence in our local communities and across this planet in which we live. We believe in diplomacy and collaboration. We reject policies based on hubris and fear. This afternoon's panel, Rethinking the Global War on Terror, will discuss how to secure world stability without resorting to armed conflict, while always maintaining our democratic processes and our personal freedoms. We could not ask for better speakers. You've already heard from two of them this morning. Kate Gould, a true leader in lobbying circles in Washington for uh, good things. Uh, the uh, committee that she works for was, of course, the lead peace organization uh, involved in a successful drive to get the Iran nuclear deal uh, enacted last year, and Kate was the lead lobbyist for that group. You deserve our thanks. And Colonel Larry Wilkinson deserves our thanks for his impeccable service in the military and more recently in the State Department and particularly uh, under Secretary of State Colin Powell and his uh, great courage in speaking out. Uh, now uh, he is a member of uh, one of uh, Virginia's distinguished institutions of higher learning, and we're glad to have him in Virginia. And I must note that he does have a book coming out, and we look forward to it, Colonel. When, when will that be? Probably after he passes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope, uh, I hope it'll be soon, and, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, well, you know what I was going to say. The other, the other panelists, uh, and we've got a treat uh, ahead of us, is uh, Dr. Shirk, Lisa Shirk, from Eastern Mennonite University in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Uh, Dr. Shirk is also, uh, has also just completed a three-year project coordinating a global network, writing a book on human security, and she's going to tell us about that. But she's uniquely qualified because her peace building experience has been in cooperation with colleagues in over 20 countries. As a Fulbright Fellow in East and West Africa, she's worked in, with countries, uh, in countries including Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, Indonesia, 15 others. So we're looking forward to the discussion. It will be one after the other. We will begin with Kate Gould. We will next have Dr. Lisa Shirk, and then we will have Colonel Wilkinson. And afterward, we will have questions from all of you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ben, and thank you for the very kind words. Um, one thing that was so remarkable about the work on the Iran nuclear agreement was that it truly was this extraordinary team effort. Um, and so many people got involved with this. Uh, all the, certainly all the peace organizations, but it went so much further than that. Um, and there were unions that got involved, and there were environmental groups, and there were all kinds of different groups that weighed in. Um, and I'm curious, how many of you, uh, let's see, so, wrote a letter to Congress, or called Congress, or lobbied, or did anything like that, um, wrote a letter to the editor on the Iran nuclear deal last year, okay, or, or during the negotiations. So many of you. Well, thank you. Thank you for doing that. And, um, you know, I think what, as we talk about what are these kinds of diplomatic solutions, what are the nonviolent solutions that actually make the world a safer place, um, then it is certainly instructive to look at, at this recent example of when the U.S. government actually did decide to um, divert from the war path and actually fall, pursue a path of inclusive diplomatic solutions. So I want to talk more about that and, and the kinds of lessons that we can learn from that. Um, but to really underscore just how, how important it was, because I think it's, it's easy to uh, forget about the threat of a war that never happened, thank God, um, that, we, that I ask you to uh, take a step back to get into a, um, take, get into a time machine and, and go back to 2006, 
when we really saw this threat of, of the U.S. war with Iran. Um, so at that time, even though the Iraq, the U.S. war in Iraq was uh, raging, that the occupation was expanding, um, that estimates came out that a million Iraqis had been killed up to that point or had died in the war um, because of the war, and, and thousands of U.S. soldiers killed, injured, um, despite all of this loss, there was talk about a war with Iran. We saw in 2006 that the Washington Post reported that, uh, the, quote, the U.S. was studying military strike options in Iran. That was a headline. Um, and that a Pentagon panel was created to plan a bombing attack that could be implemented within 24 hours of getting the go-ahead from President Bush. The headline in the London Telegraph um, just nine years ago this month was Bush setting, up America, Bush setting America up for war with Iran. The Telegraph reported that the Pentagon and CIA officers say that they believe that the White House has begun a carefully calibrated program of escalation that could lead to a military showdown with Iran. At the same time, Bush was deploying more troops to the border um, of Iraq, the, the border between Iraq and Iran, and the New York Times reported that Vice President Cheney was gaining the upper hand in the discussions about what to do uh, with Iran. Of course, he was advocating for war. So Bush's memoirs have revealed since then that we did become, we did come perilously close uh, to yet another war in the Middle East during that time. I'm sure we'll learn so much more when, when Colonel Wilkerson's memoirs come out, so about, about that time um, and before then. Um, for, for years afterward, through the Bush administration and straight through Obama's first term, there were a number of moments where we saw the U.S. and Israel teetering on the brink of armed confrontation with Iran. But we didn't go down that path. Um, there were so many people in the positions of power that wanted to wage the next U.S. war uh, in, in Iran, but it didn't happen because the American people didn't let it happen. Um, because people like those of you in this room were so outraged about the war in Iraq and didn't want to see the same thing happen in Iran. Um, so while we, we certainly mourn the, the failure of, of the peace movement to stop the war in Iraq, this is an important moment to celebrate the success of preventing another war in Iran. Um, and, and actually, not only preventing a war, but laying the groundwork for a successful diplomatic accord that resolved, um, that continues to resolve the longstanding dispute over Iran's nuclear program. So, Thanks to millions of people um, engaging with Congress, we are in a very different place than we were back then. Back in 2008, for example, um, there were only about a handful of members of Congress who were willing to speak uh, for diplomacy to solve the Iranian nuclear crisis. I remember trying to get members of Congress and their staff to uh, speak up, even with the most tepid statements. We were, FCNL was working with a number of other groups to organize a, um, uh, it was a call Iran day, um, and we wanted to speak up for Iran diplomacy. We had a, a, a booth uh, with red telephones in front of the Capitol um, where we got members of Congress to deliver press statements in support of diplomacy. Um, they could also pick up the phone and be uh, connected with an ordinary Iranian citizen um, in Iran. And it was very hard to get members of Congress to come to support that, that kind of idea back then. Um, but since then, it has become something, you know, we've seen that after just half a dozen members supported it back then, then we, now, then we had several dozen members uh, speak up in support of diplomacy, and then it became um, to where we are now, which is over a third of both the House and the Senate have actively supported a negotiated settlement over Iran's nuclear program. Um, we saw back then that there was, when we saw this, this growing momentum for members of Congress to speak up, that uh, there was a senator, of course from Illinois, who um, based his campaign, who included in his campaign that he would be talking to adversaries, uh, U.S. adversaries, that he, see, he saw diplomacy as a, um, an important way to go forward in these disputes. Um, and, but that wasn't enough, and I think people sometimes miss that that having a president who supported diplomacy um, was, was certainly not enough to get where we are today. Um, and, and it's worth remembering that as recently as March 2012, the Atlantic Magazine's Iran War Dial 
estimated that the chance of the U.S. or Israel waging war against Iran in the following year to be at a 50-50 probability. This probability was reached by averaging the estimates from a politically diverse panel of Iran and national security experts. As the Atlantic Magazine explained in their rationale for establishing the Iran war dial, when you approach the cliff edge, you need to know how far the precipice is. So thankfully, our diplomats delivered the US and Iran from the brink of war, from that precipice, after more than 30 years of our countries teetering on the brink of confrontation. Hundreds, thousands, perhaps even more than a million lives were saved because we didn't let our governments take us to the cliff edge. Now, for years, resolving the nuclear dispute seemed impossible. But in the end, seven global powers secured the most historic diplomatic achievement of a generation. The Iran Nuclear Accord, an agreement that no one could have imagined years before, was struck. And thanks to this deal, Iran has already slashed its stockpile of nuclear material, uh, ripped out its centrifuge, ripped out thousands of centrifuges, and poured concrete into its plutonium reactor, making it completely un unusable for creating plutonium for a bomb. Iran is subjected to the most intrusive inspection regime ever negotiated in history. And all this without a single shot fired. The world is safer because of it. Okay, so what are the lessons we can learn from this that can apply to these other areas of US policy today? Well, there are so many lessons to be learned. I wanna just start with three. Um, so first, of course, the basic, that diplomacy with traditional adversaries, when it looks impossible, can work. Second lesson, that US military force is empowering extremists and hardliners. And third, that grassroots advocacy is essential to advancing peace. So in the first lesson, diplomacy with traditional adversaries can work. So to tailor this lesson more specifically to, I think, what's on all of our minds, on the, the carnage on Syria, the lesson is that, that diplomacy, even with Iran and Russia, can work. Um, these are two countries in the world that still have diplomatic leverage with the Assad regime, I should say. They are the only two countries in the world that have diplomatic uh, leverage with the Assad regime. The most productive diplomatic contact th that's happening um, with the US and these countries is happening in these continued negotiations to enforce and implement the Iran nuclear accord. So while the deal is done, these groups could have to continue to meet because issues come up all the time and implement the deal. Um, we've heard recently from Jake Sullivan, who is the top foreign policy advisor for Secretary Clinton, that when, when he was asked about, well, what about this threat of a new Cold War with Russia? Is that what we're going toward? And, and he pointed out that despite all the tensions between the U.S. Um, and Russia, this, the two countries are working very cooperatively, very productively on implementing the Iran nuclear accord and continue to do so. Um, so despite, despite all the saber rattling, that, that that helpful coordination continues. Um, and then when it comes to Iran, this is the only sustained and functional diplomatic relationship that the US has with Iran right now is, is around the nuclear accord. So this channel, I should say, you know, has been a success because it has been really focused on this issue of the nuclear issue. So um, when the US and, and the Europeans and Russia and China and Iran, they all, they all meet together on this, um, it wouldn't function if they were to, any country were to take it over to say, well, now we want to talk about Syria. Um, so they do have to be separate. But I think it, it's important to, to highlight the, these productive diplomatic relationships because it can seem with the Syria track that it's going to be impossible to get the US, Russia, and Iran to ever agree on anything. Um, and, and to the contrary, right now, they actually, there is a productive relationship going on. So for the next administration, they're gonna have to think about then how do we build on this channel that's happening um, already around the nuclear accord and, and really uh, build on that momentum to de-escalate the killing in Syria. So with the second, the second um, lesson about the um, US military force emboldening extremists and hardliners, we have uh, seen this over and again that some um, who want to say that uh, we, who might say that we support diplomacy, they say, well, but we also have to have um, this, 
the, the use of uh, military force. We have to threaten Iran, and, and we saw that over and over again with the negotiations, that Congress used that as an excuse for more saber-rattling, for passing awful legislation that would, for example, give a green light to Israel to attack Iran. Well, that was, that was very counterproductive. Um, that actually only emboldened hardliners in Iran who said the U.S. isn't serious about diplomacy at all. So we have to look at that in, in all these other contexts um, in the Middle East. And I can, I can talk more specifically about those contexts in, in the, the Q&A, but I did want um, to reference that. Third, finally, the grassroots advocacy is essential to advancing peace. So this did not happen. Um, the nuclear accord didn't, didn't come out of thin air. It didn't come out of simply um, a, a certain politician's agenda. This was because years of grassroots pro-diplomacy advocacy set the stage for the Iran nuclear deal. And after the deal was signed, it was pro-diplomacy advocacy that actually sealed the deal. I have heard over and over again from members of Congress um, who were leading the Iran deal work uh, last summer, for example, who were on the phones. Um, they were on the phones with the, navigating with the, the president and Nancy Pelosi and calling those who were undecided um, and, and asking the undecided members and trying to get them to come out in support of the deal. And I have asked them, well, so um, when they were doing this, this work behind the scenes and they were talking to the undecided members, what did they need? And they, they told me, well, you know, they, um, members of Congress were already, were very thoroughly briefed by the administration, by the intel community about what would be achieved under this agreement. But often what they needed to actually come out publicly in support of it, to know that they were going to vote in support of the deal, it was the constituent voice. It was that they wanted to hear from, they, they wanted to know from the phone calls and the emails and the letters to the editor and the local editorials um, and lobby visits that were happening, and especially lobby visits, the town halls. Remember that just like the, uh, the debate that Colonel Wilkerson talked about earlier on uh, whether the U.S. should go to war against the Assad regime in 2013. This happened over congressional recess. And so, um, so for both of these issues, the, it was the, during the August recess specifically, so uh, members were at home in their states and districts, and it was um, hearing about this issue at town halls and uh, hearing people raise their concerns and say that they wanted to see their member vote in support of the deal. Um, and that, that really got a lot of them to push the, a lot of them over the edge uh, to support diplomacy. So last summer, um, after the deal was signed in July and then before Congress voted in September, we saw that that grassroots pro-diplomacy advocacy in full force. Um, Colonel Wilkerson mentioned you know, that a lot of the members of Congress uh, up to the 2013 point, they, they got, in, sorry, in the, uh, when it looked like we were going to go to war in Syria against the Assad regime, they got more messages, phone calls, all of that than they ever had before. Well, for some of them, um, they got even more than that last summer during the Iran nuclear debate. Uh, so during that time, opponents to the deal spent a whopping $40 million just on TV ads to block the deal. How many of you saw those ads? I'm sure they were, okay, airing in Virginia. Yeah, they, uh, they were very scary. And uh, they uh, equated supporting the deal with you know, supporting the Holocaust. I mean, there were uh, really crazy ads out there. And opponents to the deal, just over that summer, outspent us um, on the, just the money that they released. So this is not even considering how, how big some of these organizations are to begin with. But just over that summer, uh, two months period, they had spent the proponents of the deal by five to one. Um, those mil but despite that, and despite this notion that money wins everything in Washington, in fact, those multi-million dollar ad campaigns were no match for the kind of outpouring from the American people saying, we don't want another war, we want to see diplomacy work. So in less than two months, pro-deal groups generated more than 307,000 emails to Congress and a whopping 1.1 million signatures on petitions. And on Capitol Hill, we flat out melted those phone lines. Um, pro-deal, pro-diplomacy advocates made more than 50,000 calls to congressional offices in those two months. That's over 833 calls a day. <laughs> so, uh, and I heard when I was on the Hill and would go to offices and to try to talk to staff or, or members and then um, would hear in the background, or while I was sitting to, to wait for them, um, 
for them to come out, then I would listen to the receptionist picking up the phone and saying, hello, this is Senator so-and-so, uh, how can I help you? And then, and then over here um, saying, okay, well, I'll, we'll pass that on to the senator that you support the deal, he hasn't made a decision yet, thank you, and hang up, and then get another phone call. And this, this sort of, this was the background on Capitol Hill as members of Congress were going back and forth and overhearing this. Um, so ultimately, together, we did get 42 senators to uphold the Iran deal from congressional sabotage, including both Virginia senators, uh, thanks to many of you in the room. This success is really, it's a testament to the indomitable power of a fired up citizenry pressing their elected officials to support diplomacy and not war. Against all odds, against all those millions of dollars spent to do the exact opposite, the millions of pro-diplomacy Americans won in the face of this very uh, well-funded campaign to try to, when they were trying to derail an opportunity to solve the nuclear dispute through negotiations instead of war. So people power can and has helped to extinguish fires in the Middle East and of course we have to do far more of it. Thank you. I'm going to take off from that because the FCNL, Friends uh, National Legislation, Committee for National Legislation's group of Quakers, um, and you may have seen their bumper stickers, Just Say No to War. And I am Mennonite. I grew up here in Richmond, actually. And it's interesting that the Mennonites and Quakers have had a similar message to Congress about saying no to war. And we're eventually now moving to what does Congress say yes to? <laughs> so we're going to say no to war but we're laying out the options. And um, Kate's work on the Iran deal is a, a perfect example of us moving in Washington toward laying out what the solutions are, what the alternatives are. Um, because as we know with 9-11, it kind of took us by surprise. Um, uh, my colleague and I, the week after 9-11, started writing out what are the alternatives to going to war, because that's the path that we're taking. And I wish we had worked harder. <laughs> Obviously, we didn't. Our little article on alternatives to war in response to 9-11 um, did not work. <laughs> but I have, for the last 10 years, devoted my life to laying out what those alternatives would be. I, I started on the Hill, and what I realized, actually, from a number of uh, reports from my colleagues also lobbying for peace, is that the group of people the, the Congress listens most to were military officials. And when a military leader said something about an alternative to war, 